Well, good morning, New Hope. It's good to see everybody. Glad that we could worship together. Amen? I'm glad that we can be in God's house and worship freely. I'm so thankful for that, that privilege that we have. Thank you again to all our veterans. You guys have uh, paved a way for us to worship freely. We say thank you. I want to show a quick picture of my family. This is up on the screen. This is a couple weeks ago. Um, this, that's me on the left, that my wife next to me. Ethan, our oldest, is in the middle. Then Kayla and Blake. And uh, we have been living a, a busy uh, few months um, with volleyball and cross country. Country. We're starting to wrap that all up. How many of you parents, you live a busy season every once in a while? You just go from place to place to place. And so we're on the tail end of that. We're so thankful. But that's uh, an updated, most recent picture of my family. We're not good at going out and getting like the formal pictures. You know, sorry if, if everybody else is like that. But we're just like, hey, let's just throw everybody together, get a quick picture. And then we can prove that we still are together and we still love each other. You know, it's one of those things. So this, is, this was it after a cross-country race um, just a few weeks ago. Hey, one of my favorite restaurants reopened this, this past week. Chick-fil-A on a university in West Des Moines. They're open again. And so let's make this New Hope Week. All right? Let's go check out the new store, uh, support them, get some good food. Food and, and bring some people with you. So that's Chick-fil-A on University in West Des Moines. They remodeled their store and it looks fantastic. So today we are beginning a series titled Stories of Hope. Stories of Hope. And we did this initially five years ago. We recorded some testimonies. And then one year ago, we also did those testimonies, different testimonies, and we told these stories of people of, of hope. And so you can go back on the church's YouTube page and you can watch those testimonies. They're incredible. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to hear several stories of hope of God's faithfulness and his healing, his provision, his help, and all from people right here in our church family here at New Hope. And so we're calling these stories of hope because Jesus has been faithful and he's been good in all things. And we want you to know that because some of you are walking through hard seasons right now and you need to be reminded of God's faithfulness and his goodness in your life. And we want you to see that. And so at the end of today, um, when we close, I'm gonna ask people to come forward. We're gonna pray. A lot of you responded when Pastor Jeff said, how many of you have a need? Those are the needs. We wanna pray for you and many others. So at the end, be prepared to respond. How many of you are grateful for the word of God? Amen. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, we read of God's faithfulness. Even in the books that seem dry, you know, when you go through Numbers and Leviticus, and it's like, where is God in this sometimes? But we can see the faithfulness of God. And even though I don't understand it all, shocking, I don't understand it all, I have grown to appreciate it the older that I get. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but I wish I would have grasped it when I was younger like I do now. And I think that's just a part of getting older, but we appreciate it more and we know that it's more than just words on a page, but it is life to us. And I do have to admit though that there are some scriptures that in one season of life, they bring comfort to me and they're encouraging, they're helpful. But in another season of life, those same scriptures I read and it's difficult. Because, it's, because life is difficult. Can anybody relate to that? It's like, I don't know if I want to read that right now. I read it a couple months ago and it made sense. But today it doesn't make sense. I want to share with you a couple of those scriptures that are like that for me. In John 16, Jesus tells his disciples. Yes, yeah, sorry. We're hopping into scripture right away. Oh, my, my apologies. In John 16, Jesus tells his disciples that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Or what about James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4? He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. So when I read these, these scriptures and many others, when I read those and life is going okay, it's a Sunday morning, the sun is shining, you know, everything's fine in life. When I read those, it's easy to agree with them. 
Maybe you're in the same boat. The, the trials, the quote, all things that God works out, uh, those moments are trivial. I find, I've found myself, and maybe you've done this too, I've found myself saying, when those trials come, I'm going to be ready. When those trials come, I'll find joy, and I'll find the good in it right away. Anybody else relate? It, it, like, life is good. But then, when those trials do happen, it's like, oh God, you mean this trial? The, oh, I have to find joy in this one. I, actually, I don't like this one. Can we do a different one? You know, I'd rather, like, this is too hard right now. There's no joy. There's no good that's coming out of it. Um, I, I don't want it to be this hard. And so I, I have this, I want to have this strong and mature faith where I trust the Lord at all times. But I don't want it at my expense, If I could skip over these trials and if I could just get straight to strong faith and mature faith, that would be great. Anybody else thought that before? If we could just skip over the difficult stuff and we'll just bypass all that, all the testing and everything, that would be great. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. I think we all need reminded of that today of that chapter and verse, just like we heard from Anne today sharing from God's word, just like Pastor Zach shared two weeks ago, even in the valley, we know God is with us, though it doesn't feel like it at all times, would you agree? But we have to remember the promise from scripture that God is with us. So today, I want to share with you some of my story of hope. Um, I want you to be encouraged today and reminded of the fact, here's my prayer, I want you to know that Jesus is faithful, all right? We all have a story of hope to share, every one of us here, and so I wanna share with you a a piece of mine and that even in the trials, even in the pain, that Jesus is faithful. I find myself praying that many times for people when they say I'm going through a difficult time and they explain what's going on and we pray. Uh, I find myself often saying, remind this person of your faithfulness. Because in the season that's so hard, it's, it's easy to forget that. It's easy to lose sight of the faithfulness of God. So here's a little bit about me, my family, and I. We started attending New Hope in 1991. I was 13 years old. I, I knew everything about life at that point. Uh, my, my parents and my two older sisters, we lived up in Huxley. And so I graduated from Ballard um, High School, go Bombers. Any other Bombers here in the place? Yes, we got two over here. Anybody else? Yes? All right. Praise the Lord. You know, we've got, we're we're holy today. So I graduated uh, from Ballard. In 2001, I moved up to Spencer, Iowa to be the youth pastor at the Assembly of God Church up there. Met my wife. Um, Things were going great. And in 2005, I get a phone call from Pastor Weaver, and he says, would you consider coming down, prayerfully consider coming down to work with us here, work with Pastor Jeff as youth pastors? Um, And I, I truly almost told him no right there. Because things were fine. Our oldest, our first son had just been born a few weeks ago, uh, a Earlier that year, we purchased our first house, and we were just a few blocks away from the in-laws. And you know how that goes. Like, those are three strong reasons to say, ah, we're good. But, but we did like what we we're supposed to and said, let's pray about it. And my wife and I, a week later, we came back and we came to the same conclusion. We didn't know why at the time, but the Lord was moving us here to New Hope. And um, in, so that was in 2005. In 2006, uh, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. So he had dealt with melanoma when I was a young guy and it had come back, it had metastasized and gone internally. And so that is something that it grew quickly. And so that was the spring of 05. And by August of that year, at 57 years old, he passes away. And that was so devastating to me. Um, I was angry that this had happened. It had shook my faith. It had it shook my hope. If some of you have walked through a loss like this, I remember thinking, I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't even know if I want to pray. Anybody ever felt that before? And here I am as a pastor here at the church, and it's like I don't even have the, the energy to verbalize my prayers. I'm thankful that the Lord knows our heart, though. So I never stopped believing, but it was difficult to find the joy. Remember those scriptures? It was difficult to find the joy, and I didn't take heart like Jesus says. Take heart, 
it's, you're going to be fine. I'm going to be with you. Uh, for me, it's like there's grandkids that are on the way that are never going to get to know my, my dad, their grandpa. So that was in the spring of 2006, and that was so difficult for me to go through. Um, in May of 2010, four years later, my oldest sister, Tracy, passed away uh, from suicide. <clears throat> She was just a few weeks from turning 40, and this, this rocked me. Um, I didn't want it to be real. Man, I told myself I wasn't going to cry. <clears throat> I didn't want it to be real, so I avoided talking about it initially because if I talked about it, then it was reality. If you've ever been in those situations before, it brought reality to it. You had to process your emotions, and I didn't want to, so um, I just quickly moved on. I was heartbroken, though. Um, I, I honestly, if you've walked through a season of... Uh, someone who's passed away from suicide, I regretted that I didn't do enough to be there for her. And so it felt like I had just gotten past the season of mourning for my dad. And it's like, all right, reset. Let's start over again. Here we go. And, and it was like another round that just kind of another deep blow to me. Um, I really had a hard time seeing the good that was being worked out of this. It was difficult because all I could see was deep pain and regret and worry for her two kids and my family. And so that was in May of 2010. In February of 2017, a lot of you know you were here for when this took place, but my sweet mom passed away. And uh, this loss was different for me than my, my dad and my sister. Um, and I, either the Lord helped me see this or one of you told me this. So if you told me this, you get the credit. If not, the Lord gets the credit for this one. But um, I felt like um, I understood grief differently this time, and it's like two sides to the coin. All right, on one side of the coin, you are heartbroken, you're devastated, you're sad, right? You have those emotions uh, flooding your heart because you miss somebody and you, you, you don't want this to happen. But the other side of the coin for me in this moment was I was so thankful that she wasn't hurting in her body anymore. She had been sick and taken a lot of medicine for so many years and she wasn't hurting. She had gotten the healing that she had finally been longing and prayed for for so many years. She'd finally received her healing. And I wanna say this to encourage you. If you've ever felt that tension, even though I'm not a therapist or, or a counselor, I think that tension is okay to have both those emotions. Anybody ever felt that before? You've sensed that. It's okay to have that. She got her healing that she long prayed for. So that was in 2017 and 2019 after what I thought was a routine dermatology appointment because my dad had skin cancer. I had been going on a regular basis and I'd been going for years. They take a biopsy, call back, everything's fine. I thought this was just a normal routine one in 2019. I get the call that I also have melanoma on my head. So we're scared. You know, this is, this, it was, my dad had it on his head, mine was on my head, and so obviously panic sets in. If you've ever gotten that phone call from the doctor, you have cancer, and whatever degree it is, it panic sets in. Uh, th this, this is an aggressive type of skin cancer that if you don't take care of melanoma quickly, it's aggressive and it can go internal, and so obviously we're panicked. Our kids were still young enough that we decided to tell them what was appropriate, Mom and dad, I think it's okay to, to let your kids be a part of this, what's appropriate, what they can understand. But we didn't want to instill fear, but on the inside, mom and dad, we're panicked. If you've ever felt that, uh, that was where we were. Um, all I could think about, this is the same health journey my dad was on, he's no longer here. And so whenever you get that, your mind races fast, right? It kind of spirals out of control if you've ever been there before. You just go to the worst scenario, don't we? I don't know why that is, but that, that for me, that was like my first reaction. I wish it wasn't. So how many of you have ever had, when you've gone through a, a difficult season in life, there is a, a certain song that the Lord ministers to you. It becomes like a rally cry for you, an anthem that you have, right? It, for me, in 2019, there was a song called Highlands Song of Ascent. And in that song, there was these lines that said this. I want to read them to you. It says, I will praise you on the mountain, and I will praise you when the mountain is in my way. You are the summit where my feet are. So I'll praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. And listen to this. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. And it was in a moment right before my surgery that I was all by myself. They had to do like tracers in my head to like see where the lymph nodes, if any lymph nodes lit up. And I was 
100% alone. It was so quiet. And I felt the Lord speak to me, praise me no matter what. I'm still God. I'm still good. And so it was, it was at that moment all by myself that I made the choice. I'm still going to praise God even though the, I'm staring at a mountain right now and I didn't know what to do. It was my focal point. I was choosing to praise God. There's no, here's the deal. I, there was nothing I could do about my diagnosis. Some of you have been in this, these situations too. The fear and worry was not going to make this go away, right? I couldn't close my eyes and clap my heels three times and boom, I'm out of surgery and we're fine and nothing bad is ever going to happen again. That would be great, wouldn't it? But that's not how life works all the time. And so I was choosing to put my faith in, in, in the anchor of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6, 19, and it'll be up on your screen. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. It's firm and is secure. My hope was Jesus Christ, and it still is Jesus Christ. That anchor is at the right hand of God Almighty, and it is in Jesus Christ. And that is where our, my hope was, and it still is. So that was in 2019. And because of that, this, this past year, because of my original melanoma, I've been going every six months for checkups. Those of you who have walked a cancer journey, you know you have to go frequently just for check-ins. And I went in in January for, again, what was just a routine checkup. Um, didn't think much about it. But I, I, I know, and some of you know what this is like. You go to your oncologist or you go to your dermatologist and you hadn't been thinking about any of this until you walk in the office doors and then all of a sudden these, these thoughts are lurking in the back of your head. What if? You know, what if they find something? What if the cancer's returned? Anybody gone through that? And, and, and that was just reality for me. And so, but I walked into it. I was, I was trust, I'm trusting God. I know he's going to be good. I know he's still God, whatever happens of this. So on the 21st of January, I remember preaching a sermon called Eternal Perspectives. How many of you remember the two massive blizzards we had early January? And um, it set back our fresh wind. I was supposed to speak one of the fresh wind nights. And I ended up getting pushed back to the 21st of January. So I had had my biopsy. The massive storms happen. And then I'm preaching on that Sunday morning, the 21st, on eternal perspective. And I kid you not, it was one of those... One of those days where it felt like the Spirit say, this is for you, Brian. You need to hear this. You're about to live this out. And I've never really had that before, but I thought, okay, that's, that, that, um, that's interesting. You know, so I kind of st st um, stowed it away in my back of my mind. But in my sermon that day, I remember saying these words. If the world supplies our joy, then the world can take it away. But if Jesus supplies our joy, then no circumstance can take it away. And, and I, I kid you not, it was almost as if I was sitting on the front row, listening to myself preach, saying, this is for you, you need to hear this, you're about to live it out. It was an interesting moment. That following Tuesday, two days later, the doctor calls and gives the results, melanoma again. And I do want to say God was so faithful. You know, the scripture says we will tell of the faithfulness of God. I want to tell you the faithfulness of God in this moment. Um, I had gone to my oncologist for my checkup. She wasn't there. So she has a physician's assistant that I saw. I've never seen this person um, in all my checkups. And she's there and she just said, can I check your scalp? which it usually doesn't happen. That's dermatology. They take care of that. And I said, sure, fine. And, and she's like, hey, there's a spot right here. Next time you go, why don't you have them check it out? Well, I had, you know, like a week later, I was going into dermatology. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And um, so, so had she not been there, had, had she not asked, who knows if even it would have been caught. So I'm so thankful that God was faithful and he helped uh, that be seen. And then obviously later on, you guys, you can see on the back of my head, I've got a nice scar going on. Uh, but God was so faithful. I didn't have to take chemo. I don't have to take radiation. I still go in for my checkups, but life is okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. You know, I feel good. And I'm so thankful for God's faithfulness. But here's, what, here's a couple thoughts I want to get to today before we pray. We decided that we would be fully transparent to our kids this time. They were 17 years old, 18 years old, and it was a different season. And we decided we we're going to tell them everything. And as a dad, you know this is tough because you're about to see your kids walk through a really difficult season. As mom and dad, we're supposed to protect our kids the best we can. Right? But there's only so much we can protect them from. And so my prayer, and I prayed that going through this trial would strengthen their faith. That was my prayer. 
even though I knew it was going to be so difficult. And, and that was my top prayer request. We told our friends, we told our family, we told the pastors here that what we wanted most was for faith to grow. All right, healing was like third or fourth down on the list. But number one, I promise you, was we want our faith to grow. And this was the first time in the loss and the grief and my health issues that I had this perspective. I was motivated. I didn't want this to discourage me and to take my eyes off of Jesus. And that's how I asked people to pray. As a dad, like I said, this was harder than even going through surgeries. Is seeing your kids wrestle with this. And going through a difficult time. I remember sitting down with Blake and Kayla at the table. We called Ethan on the phone because he was off at school. Knowing that the piece of information that I have right now that I'm about to share with them is going to change them. Parents, if you've ever been in that, room, in that situation, you know what it's like. I told them it's okay to have hard days. I think, that, I think we deny ourselves if we can't allow things to be difficult at times. But I did say we're not going to hang out there forever. You can have a hard moment, you can have a hard day, you can have a hard week, but don't hang out there forever. We intentionally focused our faith on Jesus Christ and put our eyes on scripture. And, and, and I can tell you that that was our strength. That helped us out and your prayers and the prayers of our family. Um, it was something that we wanted to do regardless of our feelings. I think we ride too much on our feelings in moments like this and we get discouraged and we give up in our faith. Don't Depend on your feelings in difficult valley seasons. Go to scripture. Go to God's word. That is your substance. That is your spiritual food. So here's what I want to get at today. Each time we face difficulties and trauma, we face scars or things that scare us, we have a choice to make. How are we going to react? What are we going to do about it? with the things that have happened to us. What are we gonna do? It's a choice that we make. I heard a pastor, Levi Lusco, he made this statement. He said, how we deal with our pain and our trauma, it becomes our template. How we deal with it can become our template. A template is something that serves as a pattern for, for other things to be similar, to, to trace them out and to be similar to the original. That's a template. And so many times, these choices, they become a template for the next time we face difficulty. It's like it, it, it can become a default for the next difficult season in life and how we deal with it. And so each time of the things that I've explained to you today, each time I was there, it was like at a cro I was at a crossroads. I had a decision to make. And I would love to say with a smile on my face today that every time I considered it joy. Right? Some of you wish you could say that too. I would love to say, as soon as I got that phone call, someone passes away or your diagnosis, that it's like, I see the good in it right now. Thank you, God. And no big deal. I would love to say that. But it honestly, in all honesty, the, the opposite sometimes took place. It was hard to see the good that was going to come out of a situation. Can anybody relate to that? We're going to pray shortly. And if you're in, in a valley season of life, would you come forward so we can pray with you already, uh, ready to go. Please be ready. So the, these crossroads, they cause us how to choose to deal with the pain. It becomes our template. And so up on the screen, I want to go through these really quickly. But sometimes we choose to be defined by our pain. We're, the definition is our pain. Think of Naomi in the, in the book of Ruth in the Bible. Her name means pleasant. Naomi means pleasant. At, in a short span of time, her husband and her two sons, three people closer to her, pass away. And so she moves back home and she changes her name to Mara, which means bitter. So she allowed the, the pain and the difficulty to now define her name and who she was. There was times, especially with my dad and my sister, that, that I allow, allowed that to happen. And I didn't allow the goodness and the faithfulness of God to define me. I allowed my pain and the, the hurt to, to define me. Another thing that we can do at the crossroads, we choose to escape from the pain. At times, we can move on quickly. We resume normal life. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it because if we do, that means it's real. So let's just stay busy. We can escape from the pain. We can numb the pain. People numb pain with substances, alcohol or drugs. Maybe it's shopping. Maybe it's eating. Maybe it's pornography. 
whatever it is, we try to numb it and distract ourselves with something else so we don't have to deal with the pain and the root issue that's taking place, the healing that God wants to take place. So we numb it. And escaping the pain and numbing the pain, they tend to work closely together. Another thing that we can do is we continue the pain. We pass it down to the next generation. It's that old saying, hurt people, hurt people, right? I'm so thankful that my dad didn't do this for me and my, my sisters. His biological dad was a drunk and a womanizer. His dad abused his mom to the point where her brothers ran him out of town for how he was treating her. It was that bad. So, so biological dad is out of the picture. A few years later, a stepdad comes into the picture and he wasn't very kind to my dad either. He treated him less than his stepbrothers was just kind of like, uh, I don't want to worry about you type of thing. So my dad had several excuses to pass on the pain. And I'm so thankful that he met Jesus. I'm so thankful that Jesus healed his heart because it could be a whole different story for me right now. Parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles. What is the template that you're setting for the next generation in your family? What does that template look like? Even though it's painful, even though it sometimes is messy, are you setting them up to fix their spiritual eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith? I promise you, they're watching. You are the point of reference. They don't, they're learning from us. They're learning from you. I wish the first few times I did this perfect and I didn't. Are you talking about the trials and how good God still is and how he's still God? Listen, be an example for the next generation of how you walk through it. Don't be perfect. Be real with them, though. Let them see you trust God even in the darkest of valleys. Another choice we make we, when we're at the crossroads, we can choose to trust God to bring healing to us. And, and here's what I believe. This is when your story becomes a story of hope because you're allowing God to bring healing to the hardest points of your life. Psalm 147 verse three, he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's who our God is. That's who Jesus is. He cares for us. And so when we trust God to heal, the next thing is we can trust God to bring purpose to the pain. It's hard in the moment to see, is there any good that's gonna come out of this? But I think when we make that step, say, God, I trust you, please help me bring healing to this. Eventually, our spiritual eyes begin to see there's purpose that God is bringing out of this. When my sister passed away from suicide, as hard as that was, I found myself in situations and conversations with people that had walked a similar path. And you know what happened? I found that the comfort that God had given me, I was able to help comfort those people and point them to Jesus. God had been faithful and I wanted them to know about God's faithfulness. Hear this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. When God brings comfort to you, it's not just for you. It's meant to be passed on. It's meant to be continued. It's meant to help someone. Your story that you're going through, maybe even right now, it will bring comfort to people. I promise you. But you have to choose to let God bring healing. And, I, and I'm asking you this. Even as difficult as it is, would you choose to point your heart to God, but choose to point other people to God? That's the only way we can get through life, isn't it? Otherwise, we distract ourselves and we numb ourselves with so many other things. So my question to us today is, what is your template when trials and pain happen? What is your template? Jesus, with his nail-scarred hands, he understands. He's walked through grief and pain and sorrow. He was betrayed. He knows what you're going through. Here's the deal. He knows your story. And he can bring hope into your story and here's why because he is hope he is our living hope amen it is jesus and jesus alone there's no person there's no substance there's no distraction that will bring the hope to our heart like jesus can so what is the template that you've set up for when trials and pain happen would you stand with me today 
Each person has a story of hope. Every one of us here has a story of hope. I wish that we would be able to take time for so many more of you to be able to tell your story. But in this season of life, some of you are walking through a, a valley season. Some of you, you know, when, it, when the Bible says um, that, that mourning may last for what? A night? Some of you are in that night season right now. You know, when it, the Bible tells us that beauty comes from ashes. Some of you are on the beauty side. Some of you are on the ashes side right now. And, and, and some of us, that's all we can see is the mound of ashes around us. That's all we can see. It's the darkness. It's hard to even make through life right now because it hurts so bad. There's so much pain. I want to remind you of what God's word tells us of Jesus. Uh, this is prophetic. This was prophesied about Jesus hundreds of years before he ever came to be. And be reminded and be re encouraged today of who the person of Jesus Christ is. In Isaiah 61, he says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is us. This is who it's describing us to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Jesus does that. Provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy is coming instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That's who Jesus is. He is our hope, he is our peace, and he is our strength. And I declare God's faithfulness today, that he is faithful and he will be faithful to you no matter what you go through. You, life might be okay right now and, and enjoy it. Life might be difficult right now, run to Jesus. Whatever we do, let's let our template be, we run to Jesus because he's our hope and he's the only one that can help us, amen? Would you pray with me? If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior and you are ready to surrender to Him, you are ready to make Him your Lord, you're ready to follow and trust Him, you know it's not going to be easy, but it, it will be rewarding. If that's you and you're ready to surrender to Jesus, would you pray with me right now? Jesus, I need you. My sin is too much for me. I know you died on the cross so that I don't have to be condemned to hell. You're the only qualified person, Jesus. You're the only one that can do this for us and for me and so I accept your free gift of salvation I choose to surrender to you tonight or today Jesus I choose to trust you to follow you you are my Lord in Jesus name we pray